My guest today is Professor Frank Wilczek, who is Professor of Physics at MIT and the 2004 Nobel Laureate in Physics. Welcome, Frank. Hello. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks uh, for doing this. So, um, I know that you started in Hyde Park. I also spent a little bit of time in Hyde Park <laughs> Chicago, uh, yeah. in, a, in a different area. Um, but I, I read your bio and um, looked like you, you took some, some ideas um, from, from Hyde Park into Princeton and MIT and ultimately into something substantial. Um, and the topic of our conversation is about the book that you have written called The Fundamentals which is, I, I found that fascinating, Frank. I know nothing about it, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a blank slate here. Um, but I want to start with, so, so you have sort of, you, you talk about space, you, you talk about time. I want to start with time. Uh, okay. Time is actually such a fascinating thing for me. You know, I go to sleep, uh, I told some of your colleagues, I go to sleep every night thinking about falling into a black hole. And, <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, time has a, a significant effect there, right? So I guess that could be very restful, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so so when when gen, when the general public think about time, you think can, about or you, you can, know you can certainly escape your problems that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can escape all of the problems by falling into a black hole. Right. But so, so how how does the general public think about time? How should they how should they really think about time? Well, I think it's important not to overthink it. Actually, <laughs> um, there the, the word time, of course, is is uh, very flexible and carries a lot of different connotations uh, and, and meanings. Uh, there's psychological time, there's philosophical time, which is a, a catalog of confusions, but then, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, there's uh, physical time. And, what, and physical time is an absolutely remarkable thing that we take for granted. Uh, the most uh, a powerful way to think about it, and, and the fact that you can think about it this way is really profound, is that we have equations the, uh, that describe the way the world works very well, uh, that uh, contain some quantity called T, <laughs> T, uh, <laughs> little t, and, uh, and those, then there's one quantity T, and the whole world, everything in the world that's governed by these equations, uh, marches to the same tempo, marches, you know, develops in, in, according to uh, the, the progression of this variable T, which just moves along a line. <laughs> it's a line, it doesn't branch, it doesn't move backwards, doesn't go in circles, just moves along a line. It's symmetric as far as we can tell. And that is, no matter where you start, you get the same laws. Also to a very good approximation and in a very interesting way, if you run it backwards, you get the same laws. Uh, but, uh, and uh, that's what time is. That's what clocks measure. Uh, and everything is a clock. <laughs> that's that because everything changes and if you could uh, predict accurately and watch things closely enough you could measure time using anything uh, so that's 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 time and uh, and, uh, and the now there, there that's how should I say that's a kind of first draft of time there are many subtleties that come in if you get beyond uh, things we experience ordinarily in everyday life. Uh, when you come to the region of black holes, for instance, 
uh, time as measured by someone very close to the horizon of a black hole moves much slower than time uh, according to someone uh, far away. And there's a tiny effect of that kind uh, in the neighborhood of Earth that someone who's far up, up, in, up in space or in a satellite or an atomic clock in a satellite will tick a little bit faster than a, an atomic clock that's subject uh, that's on the surface of the Earth and feels the Earth's gravitational uh, influence, and that you have to correct for that in the GPS system. But basically, uh, to a first, but those are in, in everyday life; those are very small effects, and don't change the fact that in the underlying equations, there's just one variable t that has a very simple topological structure, namely a line, uh, that, uh, that governs the way the world works, and that, that's time. Now, you can call other things time and get all confused, but that, that's, that's, that's the rock bottom time to which everything else can be referred that you would ordinarily call time. Now, psychological time, yeah. of course, can, can be very different. In a different, sometimes if, if, they, if you're bored, Time can seem to progress very, very slowly. Uh, if, uh, or if you're in emergency, time may, may move very slowly because your, your brain processes speed up. You can see a lot. Uh, or or uh, in, in your imagination, you can move backwards and forwards in time. You can remember the past. You can make guesses about the future. <laughs> They're all, so, so time is used very flexibly to discuss all kinds of phenomena. But, but the... To me, it, you know, it's sort of like energy. We talk about energy and we mean a lot of things by it. And we talk about athletes having energy. Then you talk about um, uh, saving energy by turning off appliances. But then in physics, you learn that energy is conserved. You can get all confused. But the, but uh, the scientific. So but you have to. So you have to be very careful in, in, about how you use words. Uh, and time is especially prone to that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but okay. So I would. So, well, that that's that's my answer. That there's, there's, no, no, yes, there's no. a primary use of time in in science that's very clear. That's defined by it, its appearance in equations, and it has the absolutely astonishing implication that uh, everybody, everything in the whole world, sort of marches to the same tempo, marches to the same drummer. That there's this thing called time that we're all embedded in. Yeah. So, so what is what might be counterintuitive to um, most of us who do, who don't have a, a background in physics is that time appears to be governed by or affected by gravity and yeah, velocity, no. right? A little so. Bit. Right. Um, I mean, we don't see that. <laughs> you know. uh, if in, I drive in my car, life, I don't yeah. think you know time is different. Or yeah. if I stay close to something really big, you know, from a gravitational perspective, I don't see time being different. Those are those effects, which are uh, yeah. a result of um, the theory, of, which were first inferred from the theory of relativity. Uh, are very very small in everyday life, so that's that's why they had to be discovered, uh, uh, you know, well into the scientific revolution. Like you know, even even in Newtonian mechanics, which gives a beautiful description of many many phenomena in the solar system and, and the tides and so forth and the planetary motions and uh, it, those effects didn't appear and and and. And the theory works very, very, very well under most circumstances. But uh, but nowadays uh, we often deal with things that move very fast, uh, and and then then you have to deal with the subtleties of, of time. That uh, the well, there are subtleties of time that and uh, having to do with fast moving observers. They they can define their own time, which. Uh, is different from ordinary time, and you can relate one to the other. So there's really, they're really not. I mean, there's not. There's not as if they're two independent things. They, there's one thing, but one version of it is more useful for a moving observer. Another version is more useful for uh, a uh, a stationary observer. Uh, 
and and in gravity in general relativity that you know, with, when you have to deal with gravity it's even more tricky but uh but what i told you i said is 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 still uh, a good first draft of the truth in two senses first in everyday life those effects are quite small and then second and and, and by everyday life, I mean a very, very large segment of science and experience too, not not just you know, walking around the neighborhood each day. But uh, <laughs> the uh, but uh, uh, the other sense is that in the fundamental equations, there's still something you can point to called T that the whole universe runs according to, and so you and different observers can process it in different ways uh, but still there's 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 just there's this thing that has the topology of of uh, that that is it's it runs from past to future you know, uh, along a line described by a real number continuous as far as we know uh, and that that's that's the way it is yeah and yeah so now maybe you could maybe in the future we'll come to question that maybe we'll find that uh, time ha that there are atoms of space time that 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 space time itself is as a material in that sense that uh, but but so far the uh, continuum description with time uh, as a variable that looks like a continuous number is is very very successful even in fundamental physics. So it's a it's a continuous number in most of uh, what we measure in. There yeah. are some discontinuities in time, like black holes or traveling at the velocity of light or something like that. But no, they're not. They're not, dis they're not discontinuous. Right? They're they're ex they're uh, they're extreme and distorted. If you right. can, as I said, the ver as I said. To do justice to the experience of different observers, you may need to process this variable in different ways, but there's still just one variable. That, that's that's the thing. Uh, so, so yeah. So the person who's uh, sitting near a black hole uh, would use a version of time that from the point of view, would find it useful to use a version of time, which from the point of view of a distant observer is very, very slow, <laughs> very slow. The person at the black hole just does, seems not to be moving uh, very much according to the person who's far away, but according to the person who's actually at the black hole, everything looks more or less normal. They're just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so, but, and, and in the equations, there's, there's just, there's there's an underlying variable t that everybody can use but to describe their experience they have to process it in different ways you have to process in different ways so yeah um so so i want to think about space a little bit so set the context um for space um so i mean we have some information right the, the universe started I don't know, 13.87 billion years or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it has been expanding since then. So it's, yes. a, it's, it's a huge space. Um, at some point, things are going to fall off the, so, so, so fall off the sort of the, the boundaries because light cannot travel any faster than C. And so, so, so oh, when so you think of space, things, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, sorry. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what the question was, but let me, let me first uh, uh, refine that notion. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the, the limitation that, uh, as far as we know, no information can be transmitted from one place to another faster than the speed of light, plus the fact that uh, the universe was a very, very different place and nobody was sending any signals of any kind anywhere <laughs> uh, more than 13.8 billion years ago. So there's no messages to be had from, from right. there. 
uh, the the uh, means that there's a uh, there's a uh, a limitation to how far we can see uh, that 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 we can't get any information from further away from well. 13.87 billion year light years because yeah. that's how fast light can travel in that much time. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that the universe ends there. And in fact, at a later time, so let's say at 14 billion years, more things will have become visible. It's just it's just as if you're traveling on the Earth and your horizon changes and things that you couldn't see before now you can see. It's the same kind of effect, but in in time as as opposed to space. More things become visible uh, as the as as the universe becomes older. And, yeah. And the past and the past fewer things were visible. So there's a great issue uh, associated with that, which is given that uh, uh, new parts of the universe are constantly being exposed. Why do they look the same as the older the parts we've already seen so accurately? And that uh, the old interpretation of that was because there's only one set of physical laws that governs everything. And um, the new version that is becoming very popular and, and pretty convincing is that, uh, no, it's not that, is that the universe expanded by an enormous factor called inflation um, and and that that's what makes it uh in, early in its history so a, a small patch gives rise to everything we presently see and the small patch by its nature can't have a lot of variation so we, yeah. we just see that <laughs> yeah. yeah so so either so either explanation uh I guess is still possible, but <laughs> the second is becoming much more uh, popular and convincing now. Much more popular, yeah. So, so one difficulty, from conceptual difficulty for myself, and I would imagine general public, is that when we think about velocity, we, we have space-time stretching, mm -hmm. um, and we have things in space-time moving, <laughs> Right. Yes. So um, we know that things cannot move faster than light, but the space time, so space time fabric is stretching, and so you could actually observe things moving a lot faster than light, right? In that in that context. Oh yeah, you can you can certainly observe things moving faster than the speed of light. You can uh, okay, you can look at a star over there and look at a star over there, and you can change your vision very very fast, and then you effectively it's moved faster than this <laughs> you've seen light move fast you've seen signals that you think you know you you you're, the the motion is faster than the speed of light or if the universe is, was rotating very very distant objects could look move look like they're moving faster than the speed of light but the point is uh they're not conveying information faster than the speed of light and so it's not really when you say no, no thing can move faster than the speed of light. You have to be very careful about what you mean by a thing. A thing is something that uh, has independent information that it can transmit. So that that's what can't move faster than the speed of light. But so, you can yeah, the thing is the information. Can your focus, so. You can change your focus of interest much faster than arbitrarily fast. Uh, you, so, or, or, or if you just put a label on different things, the labels can move as fast as you like. And it's, and it's uh, but it's it's information transmission that's limited to the speed of light. It's an information transmission. So yes. Um, so. So when you think about photons, for example, Frank, uh, I know nothing about this. Um, so, you know, photons could be considered uh, a particle, yeah. could be considered sort of an information packet, so to yeah. say, right? So, so, so how do you put this in the construct of photon? So, you know, again, from a thought experiment perspective, the photon that escaped say 380,000 years since Big Bang reached us. This cosmic um, microwave. And it doesn't know any time that that transferred, right? I mean, 
in between 380,000 years since Big Bang and 13.8 billion years. So the photon that reached us now had a sort of a time that is standing still almost, right? I mean, do I understand this correctly? I don't know. Yeah. Well, okay, I mean, this goes back to the question of different versions of time being useful for different observers. Yeah. So if you were in a laboratory moving at a very, very rapid velocity, fast, close to the speed of light, uh, uh, the time that would be appropriate for you to use, so that would look like if it, you, know, you would use to describe ordinary physics of things that were moving slowly with respect to you in that laboratory, would be a different time then it would be a different combination of space and time, but a definite combination that uh, then the, the time that I find convenient to use here as, as, as a stationary observer. And uh, as a result, uh, when I look at you moving, you know, it's things seem to be use, your motions seem to be slowed down. You looking at me moving, I also seem to be slowed down. <laughs> uh, but it, it's it's kind of because we have different ways of processing uh, what's going on in space time, depending on how fast we're moving. So we we uh, our experience is organized in conveniently in different mixtures of space and time, uh, depending on how fast we're moving. But there's always some way of organizing it that that allows you to, if you're in a laboratory with things moving slowly with respect to you, to experience the same kind of world as yeah. uh, as the world that uh, a stationary observer would. would uh, right, right. So, so I want to go, um, go into sort of particle physics uh, a little bit right. again. I know nothing. I know nothing about this, Frank. I'm a blank slate. So, um, so, so your claim to fame is, I understand, is uh, on the strong force. That's my original claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> That's your original claim. So, 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 what's our current uh, understanding? We have sort of four fundamental forces: yes. um, yeah. electromagnetism, strong force, weak force, and gravity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been trying to sort of unify these things together. Yeah. My understanding is that we, we haven't really succeeded in that yet, right? Or do I understand? I, not entirely, no, no, not, no, no. Uh, uh, we, there, are, there are some successes, but not, uh, how should I say, it's certainly not a tight package <laughs> that, uh, it, how should I say, the, the the unified part, each se each part separately is extremely successful, and there are a few indications of that they should be unified, and and, and a, a, a very few sort of consequences of ideas about unification that have been checked. Uh, so the the the, unif the unification part is nowhere near as impressive as as the separate theories. The separate theories are brilliantly successful, explain a lot, have been tested in mountains of experiments very, very precisely. Um, so th those are in great shape, but the uni unification is, is kind of shaky and it's very flimsy. <laughs> yeah, a, let me go on a tangent here. Um, well, I mean, it's always um, dangerous, Frank, but so gravity is the sort of the problematic kid in the room, it seems to be. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's the most, uh, how should I, our understanding of the other three forces, I'd say is, uh, seems to be much more profound. Or, yes. I mean, partly that's because we can do a lot more experiments. Gravity is, at, at the level of elementary particles is very feeble, so it's very hard to do experiments uh, that, that really test it. Uh, the other theories have fairly rigorous, complete mathematical expressions 
that are consistent, fully consistent with the principles of relative of special relativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, in the theory of gravity, uh, that's not quite true when you when you come to describe situations where gravitational fields get very, very, very strong, like in the middle of a black hole or in the very early universe, the equations that we have break down. Uh, break down they don't they they reduce to infinity equals infinity or infinity equals zero or some some something nuts that doesn't, <laughs> infinity that doesn't and zero it. are bad, bad things. what's that no infinity and zero are bad things in mathematics so you, you had to somehow figure <laughs> out that. well they can be good but not if you want to apply the mathematics to the physical world where the answer should be manifestly a finite number because infinity or zero it's just wrong or 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 if the equations just don't you know they're supposed to be describing the physical world but they they just don't have a sensible uh they can't be used because they they just they refuse to speak so sometimes you know some you run into equations for instance that uh uh, allow you to solve up to a certain time, but then the equations just break down. Things become ill-defined after a certain time. But but in the physical world, of course, time marches on. So so something's wrong. Right? So yeah. So that's that, yeah. So that's so so so. Let me ask you this, Frank. You know, again, I I know know nothing about this, but. Um, since we have such great difficulty with gravity, mm. do you think it's an effect? Uh, I mean, that sort of you know multiverse ideas floating around. So, do you do you think it's sort of an extraneous effect on our universe? Is that why we have such difficulty figuring it out? No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't call it extraneous. I, oh, you mean extrinsic? Maybe it's due to some other world or something. No. Uh, no, we well, okay. I, I, I wouldn't. Again, I wouldn't over dramatize or over overstate the the difficulties with gravity. I know a lot of people do. They they, they want to justify their existence of, of uh, worrying yeah. about gravity. Uh, the uh, but um, but we have an extremely successful theory of gravity, yeah. Einstein's general relativity, that has you know, uh, predicted many, many uh, uh, things that have been observed, brilliantly confirmed, gravitational waves, the existence of black holes, uh, the, uh, the, the slowing of clocks in gravitational fields that we mentioned before, uh, several different effects, the perihelion rotation of Mercury. So, so uh, so general relativity works, uh, and astrophysicists use it every day in, in making predictions. And, uh, and so, it, and you know, it's sometimes stated that it doesn't, it can't be used with quantum mechanics, but in fact, it can. And astrophysicists do that every day and successfully. Uh, so, uh, but uh, so, so, but there are problems. There are the, the equations as it do break down. In extreme conditions, uh, also they also break down. If you try, if you, they also. Uh, how should I say? If you try to uh, notionally in your mind, you can do thought experiments where they break down at very high energies. Uh, so, you know, physicists want to do better, and uh, so that's that's a very active area of research. It's very challenging because we don't get a lot of help from experiment. The conditions where general relativity breaks down are so extreme that they can't really be produced in a laboratory. So it's all thought experiments. Uh, then, uh, and thought experiments, well, the thing about thought experiments is that you can have, they, you don't have a way of checking them. You can think whatever, you know, you think things that don't, aren't, don't correspond to reality, right? You know, that the, um, um, you know, Einstein was the great master of thought experiments, but 
in the Bohr-Einstein debates, when he did thought experiments about quantum mechanics, they were all wrong. He wanted to be, he had intuitions that quantum mechanics would break down in this circumstance and that circumstance. And those thought experiments you can actually do now and he was wrong about all of them. <laughs> I mean, that were, they, uh, so thought experiments are very dangerous. They, they, uh, they, they, uh, anyways, but uh, what was I going to say? Oh, the other thing to say about gravity, though, is that whereas our four theories of the other three forces sort of have a strong family resemblance, they're all based on what are called gauge symmetries, and uh, they, they, they have a strong, very strong family resemblance. They are all, from some perspectives, they are all kind of generalizations of Maxwell's theory of electricity and magnetism. And they're kind of grand generalizations. And there are, there are variations and, you know, there are things that aren't obvious at all. But, but yes, the, but, but ultimately they, they have a lot of in common with uh, Maxwell's theory of the 19th century. And we had quantum mechanics that can be done uh, well after a lot of, after a lot of brilliant insights. Now that's a smooth procedure to quantize those theories. Uh, the the um, but gravity is different. It, it's it, it it is based on a rather different principle. I mean, technically, the difference yeah. is that the other particles are based on spin one. The other interactions are based on exchanging spin one particles, particles that have one unit of angular momentum, like uh, photons, uh, gluons of the strong interaction and the W and Z bosons of the weak interaction. Those are all spin one particles and there's a common theory of those, which is, as I said, is kind of a generalized version of the Maxwell theory. But gravity is based on spin two. <laughs> and that's it turns out much more complicated than 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 spin one and uh and so far we you know it, it, it's uh it's not uh it's, it hasn't been fully absorbed into it hasn't fully absorbed. as so, i said the, equa uh, the, equa the equations break down and, and yeah we don't know yeah i mean um again frank i, I don't know nothing about this so so I think about theory of relativity as sort of a theory of geometry. Um, it is not really about fundamental particles. But that's really not so clear. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, Einstein invented uh, general relativity by thinking about geometry of space-time, and it's a brilliant, you know, an, an astonishing feat of intellectual acrobatics and <laughs> insight and persistence and everything. It was, you know, without doubt, one of the grandest intellectual achievements and ever to, to come up with the theory of gravity based on those considerations. Uh, but subsequent developments uh, showed that you could have done it, you, you didn't, if, if, if it weren't for Einstein, <laughs> there was a different way that it could have happened. It would have happened maybe 25 or 30 years later. Right. But as people understood particles better, uh, this notion that particles can have different spins and, and that particles of different spin can only couple in, sp in very constrained ways gives you an alternative way of deriving general relativity. That has nothing to do with space-time geometry. Mm. Really. Mm. It's, it's more of a particle approach. And nowadays, uh, we, there, there's that, and there's also yet another approach from uh, string theory, which doesn't start from space-time uh, geometry. Right. It also, it starts from just from the idea that the fundamental degrees of freedom in the world are quantum mechanical strings, and and that also leads to general relativity. It also leads to the theory of gravity. Well, the de derivation is not exactly uh, <laughs> rigorous, but 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 it but it does, but uh, it does it, it it's it's uh, or, you know, or or properly digested, but 
it does um, it does also lead to general relativity. So Einstein reached it one way, but there are other ways of reaching it that uh, look much more like conventional particle physics. Mm. That's one thing. The other thing is that our theories of conventional particle physics, Maxwell's theories, can also be put in geometric terms. They can be put in geometric terms. People don't often do it, yeah. but I do. I mean, I, I, you, you, you can very much think about uh, the, uh, the uh, for instance, the colors of different quarks as being descriptions of their positions inside a space, inside the, what, what we call the internal space. And, and that space has geometric, has a lot of symmetry, has geometric properties. And so you can, you can achieve a quite lovely geometric description of the other interactions. That wasn't the way they were discovered historically, <laughs> but it could have been. And so it's, it's kind of a historical accident that, that yeah. general relativity has this reputation of being geometric and the other theories of, of fundamental interactions have this reputation of not being geometric because general relativity, does, I mean, gravity doesn't have to be described geometrically and the other interactions can be described geometrically. So, so really it's, it's, not, it's not such a contrast as, as appears on the surface. It's kind of an historical accident that they appeared so different. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing, uh, Frank. Um, again, you know, from a sort of an ignorant perspective. Uh, so you go inside a proton mm -hmm. and you say you have um, quarks, your gluons. Yes. Um, and we thought we had a, a few quarks, but now it seems like a sea of quarks and gluons. It's a sea of quarks, right. Yes. Quarks are much lighter than uh, much lighter than protons, so you can have a lot of them inside a proton. And gluons have, have zero mass, actually, so you can really have a lot of those. <laughs> That's, uh, right. um, yeah. One thing I worry about is this Russian doll game that the, the god, whoever she is, is playing but with us. Um, Every time we look inside, we find many, many new things. No, um, that's not true. No, no? no. okay, it's go been ahead. a long time since it's been, you know, in my career, very few new things have been found. <laughs> it's almost 50 years now. <laughs> the uh, the description of fundamental physics that we've we've had that really matured, I would say, in the in the 1970s theoretically and then uh, experimentally in, in subsequent years uh, has held remarkably uh, well to building new accelerators, looking at higher energies, looking at other astrophysical and cosmological phenomena. Very little new has been, has been discovered in all those years. The, the great frustration of <laughs> many of my colleagues, especially the experimentalists, uh, the, 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 uh, and, and so that's one aspect. You don't keep, you know, you don't keep finding new things, uh, necessarily. And in fact, there are indications that, uh, we, we, we're getting very close to the, to rock bottom in the sense that things like electrons and quarks, unlike protons, I mean, you're quite right about the proton. Proton is actually very complicated, but the uh, but the fundamental particles really do seem to obey rigorously uh, very very simple equations. Now, by simple, I mean simple. Once you've studied, done a graduate school course in relativistic quantum field theory and and group theory and so on. So once, but once once so, uh, but they are they're simple in the sense, in a very precise sense, that you can write well-defined uh, computer programs that would be quite short that would describe quarks completely and electrons completely. The equations are unambiguous. They can be taught to a computer. And given long enough, 
the computer would be able to calculate everything there is to calculate about the behavior of these particles. So uh, it would be a much shorter computer system, uh, operating system, much, much shorter program than, for instance, uh, the operating system of any modern computer, let alone something like Microsoft Word. <laughs> <laughs> Very short computer program. That, that, uh, and that, if you think about it, that's what it means to have uh, 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 an irreducible description of simple entities that build up the world. Hmm. And experimenters, as I've said, they've tried to look to to find signs that this uh, these simple equations break down somehow or don't work that that there there are other things inside that that um, make it uh, an illusion that the electron is a simple fundamental particle uh, but so far the the evidence is that if there is internal structure it's very very hard to uh, to excite to find signs of it uh, that it's very, 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 how should I say, if there isn't internal structure, it's within a very, very, very small region of space, and and it's very, very stiff, so to bring it out is very difficult. So the, these fundamental particles really do seem to be uh, um, pretty fundamental. <laughs> pretty fundamental, yeah. So for the Zen public, Frank, you know, the intuition um it's really difficult right so if you go inside an atom that's, and, why, I wrote and, the book. that's why i wrote the book you know? <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's, a, it's a beautiful okay. it's a beautiful thing you know right. so if you go inside an atom could you sort of describe sort of how it looks like um you know we have this concepts of you know planets around the sun yes. and stuff like that but the atom is nothing like that, right? Uh, well, it's it, it's certainly uh, significantly different. <laughs> yes, I mean at at the beginning of the twentieth century, that was more or less the picture that, that people. Well, at the very beginning, people had no idea even that there were atoms. <laughs> that, uh, and then for a brief time, they had vague ideas about atoms, but then. Uh, the decisive experiments were really uh, around 1912, 13, the so-called uh, Geiger-Marsden experiments and the Rutherford model of the atom showed that there's a very small concentration where almost all the mass of an atom is in all of its positive electric charge. And then you yeah. have electrons in a cloud uh, outside that that's much larger. So the nucleus where the, the protons and neutrons and uh, most of the mass and all of the charges is about, in radius, it's about one one hundred thousandth of the size of the electron cloud. So the electron cloud would is you, much bigger. Now, at you, first, people thought, had very much this model of the solar system in mind. You know, particles held together by electric forces instead of gravity, but otherwise they're very similar. Uh, yeah. You had yeah. electrons orbiting at, uh, around the nucleus, just as planets orbit around the sun. However, uh, and and that's uh, inadequate, but it's not entirely misleading <laughs> in the sense that yes, there is a small nucleus. Yeah, yes, things there moving are, around, <laughs> but but the, the the rules of the game are very different. There's the quantum mechanics. Uh, can't, it, it has to be applied uh, with some sophistication to do justice to how atoms work. And, uh, and so uh, the fact that <clears throat> there's uncertainty in the positions of electrons, that they're really described by uh, wave functions as opposed to specific locations, uh, is really absolutely essential to do justice to the observed phenomena. So, uh, so what do you mean by wave function is some sort of probability distribution? Um, it's wave. roughly speaking a, a probability distribution. It's uh, technically it has a little more structure than a than a probability distribution. 
a, it's a complex number. It's a, a field of complex numbers, not real numbers, and 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 the probabilities are actually the absolute square of the of the complex numbers. So it's a little more than a probabilities distribution. Well, it's a lot more as far as physics, uh, mathematics, and physics is concerned. But but to a, for intuitive purposes, roughly speaking, it it can be thought of as a probability sort distribution. Sort of probability distribution. So. So you have this atom. Yeah. Um, most of the mass is in the center, which is very, very, very yes. small uh, right. um, volume. And then you have some expectation of electrons sort of moving around. We have some probability expectations of where they might be, but we don't precisely know where the electrons are, right? So, so, so I don't right, really no, know what this. In uh, fact, you can't. Right. It's even dangerous to say that they are anywhere. What we learn in quantum mechanics is that you have to be very careful about statements of what is, <laughs> if uh, if if you're if you're not actually uh, experimentally or observationally determining what is. So, uh, when you calculate in quantum mechanics. Uh, you have, if you don't measure where an electron is at some time, then you have to take all the possibilities into account in, in order to calculate what happens at a later time. So right. it's not that the electron is secretly somewhere, you just don't know where it, it really isn't anywhere, it's everywhere, unless you actually measure that it's somewhere. <laughs> That's right. Uh, right. That's, and so the, to complicate the 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 conversation further is so there's a field and the particle questions right mm. um again it's not very intuitive to you know sort of general public right so um i mean you can think of a field and then you can think of a particle how do those things differ i mean how do how do those things interact well the fields are much more fundamental than particles so uh, we should start with fields and then discuss why they how they can manifest themselves as particles sometimes for some some purposes and the basic the basic mechanism is okay the fundamental equations are in terms of fields but uh unlike your intuition about these are quantum fields and that means that uh not all solutions of the field equations correspond to reality. Only solutions that have a certain element of discreteness. Uh, so, so, uh, only certain solution, uh, no, better way to say this, only certain solutions actually correspond to reality. These are the solutions that- A lot of uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty. In the well, the uncertainty comes from the fact that it's fields, <laughs> so right. it could be any. So, uh, but but uh, only certain fields are allowed uh, by the rules of quantum mechanics. It's a lot of different kinds of fields are allowed, but but only but still structured. And uh, when you interact with the 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 universe of possibilities for fields, you jump often from one allowed configuration to another one, and the jump occurs in discrete units of energy and also, and also often at, in particular places. At, and, and so the jumps look like particles. Okay. So, so they can be interpreted as particles. And because uh, in everyday life, we, we often, uh, we don't have to worry about the subtle parts of quantum mechanics. We just, see, you know, we're very, we have a lot of experience with, uh, with working with particles and, and or solid objects, and uh, that that's very helpful and uh, you know, very well matched to the way we think. But uh, it's not the way the quantum world works. In the quantum world, you have to get accustomed to the idea that fields are really the primary reality. And uh, particles are kind of a convenient way of thinking for certain limited purposes. <laughs> and so, so, you know, we thought atoms were fundamental. We figured they're not. 
Um, either protons, neutrons, and electrons are fundamental. It looks like they're not. Well, electrons um, are. Electrons are. Electron, <laughs> electrons are still fundamental. As far as we can tell, yes. But protons, protons and neutrons are not because they're made up of quarks inside that's, the that's nucleus. Right. That's right. Quarks um, yes. So, so I don't know anything about this, Frank. So, so, so we have this photons stuff going on well, and so electrons so. going on. So, what's the connection between photons and electrons? Are there any? Yes. Oh, yes. Very <laughs> much. Uh, so, uh, well, electrons when they interact with one another. Uh, you can describe that as being due to exchange of virtual of what are called virtual photons. So the the equations for electrons and photons are tightly coupled in something called uh, electrodynamics and in the quantum theory quantum electrodynamics. And so all the observed so the electron it's 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 very much like uh, maybe and and maybe it'd be more familiar in the case of gravity uh, when you have a body like the Earth or the Sun, it affects other bodies because there's a gravitational field and that transmits forces between one body and another. The same thing for the electromagnetic field. When you have electrically charged particles, uh, they affect the electric and magnetic fields and, and they're also affected by electric and magnetic fields. And so the motion of charged particles changes the electromagnetic fields, which then can change the motion of other charged particles. So their interactions are affected very much in, in, to, uh, by, uh, by, the, by the fact that they uh, interact with the electromagnetic field, and the electromagnetic field can be thought of as made of photons. Uh, also, the, the, most dramatic, the most direct and dramatic thing is that uh, when charged particles, and in practice that usually it means electrons, uh, uh, move violently, they change their state in an atom, often they radiate, they radiate photons, they radiate electromagnetic radiation. And so, so they, that's a very, very direct manifestation of the fact that, that the charged particles interact with photons. And, they can make, but there are many other things too. Like uh, if you have uh, uh, electrons and anti-electrons, positrons coming together, they can come together and annihilate into photons. Into photons, yeah. Into photons. Now, in terms of elementary particles, that's kind of exotic, but it's also now uh, essentially the same thing. Uh, uh, it is what helps make uh, our computer screens work and many other things, uh, light emitting diodes, LEDs. You have electrons and absence of electrons, things called holes inside solids, mm. and electrical fields can be used to make them come together and then they emit light. And that's, 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 that's now, you know, that's, that's, that's becoming the, uh, the common source of light. And we're not, we're not, we're not, we're, you know, incandescent the classic incandescent light bulbs are becoming obsolete and instead we're having light emitting diodes which are particles and antiparticles are charged electrons and their holes inside uh, inside materials inside dielect inside uh, semiconductors combining and annihilating into light so that's yes yeah, so, it's, uh, so the, yeah, I mean, it's it's a beautiful thing, uh, Frank. It's a beautiful. Uh, I wish I, yeah, I studied some physics. Um, yeah, yeah. It's so a beautiful thing. Uh, so physics, you shouldn't think of as physics. People shouldn't think of physics as scary. It's really yeah. fun, <laughs> and it's all, and it helps. Un it expands your mind and helps you appreciate many, many things that are going on in the world at a deeper level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think of physics, you know, I think of science as a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my colleagues uh, don't like this analogy, but the top of the pyramid is physics. If you don't really understand physics, you can go anywhere. <laughs> I mean, I can say biology, chemistry, 
economics. Oh. Uh, without physics, you can't really go anywhere. So at the end of the day, physics... Well, is... I, okay, I don't want to antagonize my colleagues by <laughs> signing on to that. Uh, but let me make a weaker statement that I, I think is true, is that anyone, anyone, any human being, any uh, curious, intelligent human being can expand their minds, enjoy life more, and, and have a richer experience of reality by understanding or, uh, how the physical world works these things, at, a, at, at a fundamental level. And that, that's what I was trying to accomplish in fundamentals, is to make that available in an honest way. Uh, and for scientists, which is what you were alluding to, it can also be very valuable in their work. So, for instance, I mean, you can, you, you can certainly be a practicing biologist without knowing... Uh, anything about quantum mechanics, any, any, any of the deep facts about quantum mechanics. So you can certainly get it by. Uh, however, you might miss out on opportunities to, do, to uh, 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 design new kinds of instruments that would enable you to see things that uh, you otherwise couldn't see, or uh, maybe more realistically to take the instruments that other peoples have designed and really understand what they can do <laughs> and, and use them in your work. So knowing, no, certainly knowing uh, something about fundamental physics is an, could be a useful tool to all kinds of sciences and, and also yeah. a source of problems for of, of interesting challenges for mathematicians. And not to mention that uh, Philosophers who talk about reality really should learn what real, how reality works, <laughs> and, that, and it's mind expanding. It's not what you think. It's not something you would guess from introspection. No matter how smart you are, believe me, you would not by introspection get to quantum mechanics, and yet that's how the world works. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean. Uh, and, 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 and dare I say it, even theologians, if they want to talk about the nature of ultimate reality, really should uh, understand what, how phys what physical reality is and how it works. If you want to understand God, you should understand God's work. That's another way. So, so, so yeah, so every, every human being owes it to themselves <laughs> to, uh, to, to give fundamental science a chance. You can really, you can really ex expand your mind, enjoy life more, see more, uh, if you do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is so interesting, Frank. I mean, uh, you know, clearly, uh, um, I don't know anything about this, but um, it's a sort of an interesting sort of uh, policy question. Uh, I, I don't know, this is not your research, but um, so I was an engineer, and then I, be, you know, went into economics. We use some of the same mathematics as yes. physicists do. Um, the the more important question I think you're asking is, what what is that you want to understand, really? You know, so so yes. the, the the next undergraduate student, the next graduate student, the PhD student, the postdoc. What is that you really want to understand? And I'm, I, I have a biased perspective on this. It, <laughs> it, 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 it comes back to sort of fundamental physics. Um, you know, if you don't understand physics, I tell this, uh, my daughter's going through medical school. <laughs> uh, I, I tell her all the time that if you don't understand physics, you probably don't understand anything. Um, <laughs> you know. no. Okay, you said it. I'm not. I'm, I'm not yes. <laughs> yeah. And I wouldn't put it quite that way, but but I'd rather put it constructively, which is that 
if, if you understand physics, it op fundamental physics, it opens a lot of doors whose existence you wouldn't otherwise even suspect and, and uh, expands your horizons. And it's really fun. It's really beautiful. It's full of surprises. And, uh, and if, if you don't do that, on the other hand, and, and certainly if you're working in science or philosophy or, or economics for that matter, uh, you'll always have this nagging doubt, you know, I'm, you know, I'm really missing something. <laughs> I really, I really left out something <laughs> that, that, that is, that is how the world works at a, the physical world works. And, and, uh, you know, you, of course, for many purposes, you can avoid looking too closely into that. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't affect or, uh, in any important way what you do, but, but it might, and you don't, uh, unless you look into it, you have no idea whether it does or not. And you know, a lot of philosophers do complete nonsense because they don't know. <laughs> yes. And, yes. So the, the, and it's a pity because, you know, they're, in, they, they're discussing interesting questions and really trying to wrestle with them, but, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're playing checkers when the reality is chess. You know? <laughs> so, so, so let me ask you a policy question, Frank. You at MIT yeah. teaching kids. Um, how should we really think about this? So um, I, I strongly feel that, I mean, I'll show my bias, and you probably have the same bias, I would imagine. Physics, without knowing physics, you can go anywhere. Um, I wasn't in <laughs> fear. <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't want to put it that way, but I'd rather put it positively. Learn physics, you'll be glad you did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you see, that, I mean, I clearly have a bias around this, Frank. You know, so I was an engineer and then I went to economics and, you know, um, uh, and we use sort of, in economics, we use sort of the same mathematics. You know, we have stochastic yeah. processes and... Right. Variational um, principles. And yeah, so, so we actually have Newtonian stuff yes. and many-dimensional uh, spaces, and yeah, I, I'm I looked into economics a bit, <laughs> and yeah, it's, it looks there are a lot of familiar things there. There are a lot of familiar mathematics there, um, but you know, so I, I look to kids, you know, um, the kids who are sort of sort of in undergraduate school today at MIT, you know, Chicago, Princeton. So what should they be really thinking about? You know, what, what, is, what is their path to the future, you think? Well, it would be presumptuous of me to, to uh, prescribe a unique path for people and many interesting paths and probably ones that I haven't thought of that, that uh, could, uh, could advance. Uh, but you have a lot of knowledge around this, Frank. I mean, the universe, but... I would certainly highly recommend to any person who uh, uh, has intellectual aspirations to uh, read, read fundamentals, <laughs> and then <laughs> it won't. And uh, you can decide if you want to go deeper into the things that are discussed there. But it's, I hope, a painless and enjoyable way to get exposed to what our best understanding of uh, physical reality is in a way that's uh, you know meant sort of meant to be from scratch not 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 uh, and not uh, uh, not too heavy so not 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 with equations uh, but you know trying to distill what I've learned in 50 years of struggling with physical reality now uh, into into what are the really profound most basic takeaway messages yeah i think i think that's really important um fundamentals um i think you, you know the way that you've laid out the ideas there um it's quite important um in my view um 
I mean, you you could have different ideas around what you want to do, but you have to you have to sort of fundamentally understand how the system works, right? I mean, it takes well, some time. Uh, yeah, and, and it's not just physics. I mean, yeah, uh, 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 well, I'm a product of the University of Chicago, and at least when I was there, and, I, and even more so before that, I don't know how much it's in, in force now. Uh, there was a very uh, um, conscious effort during the first couple of years of undergraduate study to get exposure to the fundamentals, if you like, of a wide variety of things. You know, uh, this went from reading some of the the uh, the, the classics of. Uh, of ancient philosophy and modern philosophy to having basic requirements in uh, chemistry and physics and biology and uh, and I it's a great I think it's it's a very good thing that that people should broaden their minds uh, before they uh, narrow their minds <laughs> before they focus I mean put it to put it positively because uh, you're know, really to make important progress at some level you have to focus but first before focusing you should see what's out there and uh, and 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 that would also enable you to bring in important ideas from other places about the thing you you ultimately focus on you know because you have a sense of what's out there and there might be relevant stuff out there and, and so and I think physics has a very central role in, in in that because it's about physical reality. And I, by physics, I mean, I want to interpret that broadly to include uh, uh, cosmology, you know, rudiments of, of uh, how matter actually works. I don't mean just just elementary particles or but but just the how should I the old word that I really like is natural philosophy, you know, the, nat the natural philosophy of of physical reality. It's, so it's mostly what people now call physics, but it's got other stuff too. <laughs> Understanding the nature of complexity, the nature of evolution, things like this. So in, in conclusion, um, Frank, you know, so I had a lot of your colleagues on, we talked about dark matter, dark energy. Uh -huh. we, we talked about, um, um, the gra gravitational wave detection instrument, what is it called? LIGO. Um, LIGO, yeah. uh, So we talked about all that stuff. Um, at the end of the day, you know, what is your sort of sense that are we progressing in our... So, so I look back, you know, let, let me put my bias on the table and then you can completely reject it. So as I look back, I see Einstein, I like Maxwell, um, I see um, Hubble, and I say, 100 years have passed. Did we really progress further <laughs> oh, from those oh, fundamental yeah. understandings? Yeah. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I think the, uh, the achievements of, of uh, getting what we now call the standard model absolutely are worthy of standing beside beside those uh you know getting getting concrete precise equations well for the strong and weak interactions yeah. as i said they have a family resemblance to the maxwell equations but they're not the maxwell equations they're they're an extension of them and uh and and fully worthy in terms of beauty and and yeah. wealth of phenomena and uh, maybe the most important of all, uh, with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics really, I would say there have been two real revolutions in physics and a couple of secondary revolutions. <laughs> so yeah. the two real revolutions were Newton, who established the fact that you could get very precise mathematical laws and it sort of proof showed that by example and set the stage for many many years of progress and sort of set the stage for how what you can aspire to 
And then quantum mechanics. Those are the two great revolutions. Quantum mechanics really changed what we think of as physical reality. It's, it's a vast change from everyday life. Very different in mechanics. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if you're running out of time. Uh, imagination. I, you know, I would say that uh, then the secondary revolutions were classical field theory. So that that's uh, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism and Einstein's general relativity, which of course includes special relativity. Special relativity is kind of a corollary almost of Maxwell's theory. Yeah. But then we have also general relativity. And then the second secondary revolution. <laughs> so, so there are two huge revolutions and two pretty huge, slightly smaller revolutions. The, the other slightly smaller revolution was getting concrete, precise equations for how matter works. And that was the work of the uh, latter part of the 20th century. Yeah. Now, and uh, no, no, no. It's, uh, it, I don't think it. I don't think it's as celebrated as it should be because it's, know, it's yeah. absolutely, absolutely worthy of uh, of that. Much better than Hubble, but and much. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, Hubble. Well, everything. With, everything seems to start. Uh, everything what? seems to start, uh, Frank, at the University of Chicago. Uh, clearly, I have a bias <laughs> around this, but. Um, so, so, so going back to what you were saying in terms of, so, um, could we talk a little bit about, I know that we are running out of time, could we talk a little bit of the strong force specifically? I mean, this is, you know, this is your claim to fame. Um, no, no, no. Well, you just mentioned dark matter. I think I know what dark matter is and essentially uh, set the stage for future discovery of it. This comes was axioms. Uh, and Axiom, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I realized there was a particle and figured out its cosmological significance. And now I'm, well, there are many people around the world searching for them with uh, increasing sophistication and increasing hope of finding them in, in, in coming years. Uh, and I've been helping to design the experiments too. So, yeah, so, uh, so, so don't you, count, you, you, don't count. Don't don't count me out of the uh, glamorous things. I do some of the glamorous things too. <laughs> so so you you putting Frank, you putting your chips on axions. Yeah. You haven't found any of them yet. No. Um, we could. Well, actually, no? actually, uh, there are what's called emergent axions, which are not the fundamental axions, but uh, sort. Of, Quasi, what we call quasi-particles, kind of emergent uh, excite phenomena, emergent things that look like particles inside materials that obey the equations of axions. And that's become a, a little cottage industry in condensed matter <laughs> physics that it's, it's really, it's a real, you know, really an experimental subject with uh, some from very nice uh, results. So, so it's not entirely divorced from reality from experimental reality and I it might be most of the mass in the universe <laughs> but, but very difficult to detect and we try I love the name axions did you coin it yes well I borrowed it from the name of a laundry detergent that's uh, I saw this laundry detergent <laughs> once when I was shopping with my mother and uh, yeah, I thought to myself that that really sounds like a nice name for a particle. If I ever get a chance to name a particle, I'll, I'll call it axion. And then a few so years if, later, <laughs> if, if anybody's listening to this, um, <laughs> high energy physics, astrophysics, particle physics, probably the most interesting fields of anything. I mean, I don't know anything about it, but it, it seems it seems interesting. Well, there's a lot of interesting things. I mean, yeah, but it, certainly there are some glorious things that have happened recently, and are and some other glorious things that are happening now, and some other glorious things that I hope will happen uh, in in this domain of fundamental physics, but but also uh, uh, related areas of uh, 
cosmology uh, and also uh, mathematically related or inspired developments in, in uh, an understanding materials, quantum materials. Yes. Uh, so this is tremendous. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, some of the ideas that came out of fundamental physics are now uh, feeding into uh, ideas about new kinds of computing, quantum computing, new ways of processing information, new kinds of materials. Uh, so, Where do you stand on string theory, Frank? Um, well, string theory is, is uh, a very interesting attempt to uh, uh, get at gravity in a different way, as we discussed. And it's amazing that you can do it. And it uh, and the, the the structures that you discover on, on when when you uh, get into this are extraordinarily rich <laughs> and have led to many many fruitful developments in mathematics that are just amazing. But so far, uh, the mapping of string theory onto concrete phenomena in the physical world is very, very vague. It, it just, and uh, I guess many of us were hopeful in, in the early days or the modern renaissance of string theory was basically in 1984 uh, that, that it would, it would sort of, you know, It'd take off. Would, would, yeah, would solidify and take off, right? Uh, and that really hasn't happened. No. And, yeah. and, it, and it's been a long time now. It's <laughs> yes. not, it's, you know, time, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, okay, when you have this, uh, some child prodigy, okay, and now, now the child prodigy is, is getting into their 40s. <laughs> they're, not a, they're not a child prodigy anymore. <laughs> and, but know, the mathematics, the mathematics <laughs> appears very elegant, right? I mean, it seems well, the, yeah. the mathematics. Well, yeah, the, the, certainly a lot of very first class mathematics has come out of people wrestling with string theory and trying to develop yeah. it. Uh, but in a way, it's almost self fulfilling in the sense that uh, people have seized on structures that are suggested by string theory, and also for that matter, just by quantum field theory, you know, supersymmetry and, and the yep. structure of quantum field theory that has nothing to do with strings, nothing to do with right. things, that, the curves that are made, that close and make strings, uh, and, uh, you know, extended them to many, many dimensions, extended them into uh, uh, fanciful regions of, uh, worlds with different kinds of elementary particles and more symmetry and so so uh so part of the elegance is that people you know math people mathematicians decide or people decide uh what mathematics is elegant and they work on it. and once once you free yourself from the burden of describing the physical world Nothing there. <laughs> then, uh, then, then the mathematics that you develop, if it's worthwhile at all, it's elegant. It's got to be elegant. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. <laughs> so, so, uh, so yes, the, there are a lot of elegant results about higher dimensional geometry, also about knots, also uh, a, a so, whole variety of things that have come out of people thinking about string theory. Uh, and I think that's a tribute to the ingenuity and cleverness of of the people uh it doesn't mean that the theory describes the physical world okay. so so would you reject frank would you reject string theory from a quantum no. uh, quantum chromodynamics perspective no 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 it doesn't well it's not a matter of rejecting quantum chromodynamics is what it is uh, uh it's very, it's very self-sufficient. Doesn't need string theory. <laughs> is doing very fine. Describes a wealth of experiments. Is uh, absolutely. It's a glorious theory. Uh, it's kind of the opposite in the fact that, it, in the sense that you can calculate very, very precisely using computers and get results that you compare with experiments and 
that's you what can test it. You can test it and prove well, it. It's, te- not, it's gone beyond testing. People used to say they were testing it. Now they just use it. They use it. It's, they, it's now called calculating backgrounds. When you cal- <laughs> <laughs> the same thing that used to be called testing QCD, but but you know, more precise, more well developed and mature is now called calculating backgrounds. And yeah. experimentalists absolutely rely on it, just as they rely on uh, Maxwell's equations. Or, you know, there's no, it's yeah. it's gone beyond being tested. It's it's just as true as scientific theories ever get. It is <laughs> that, uh, that that it's it's not going to go away ever. Uh, it's going to always be describing yeah. a very large body of, of phenomena. And, uh, all, all I can say to students out there is that if I had a brain. I would have gone into physics, <laughs> um, but unfortunately, uh, it's not yeah. going to be. Um, so th- there's, there's there's a lot. There's a lot happening. Um, yeah. We still don't know most of it. That that's the beauty of physics. I mean, we yeah, just by some, we still measures, don't know most of it. Yeah. by some measures, we certainly don't know most of it. We don't know. Uh, we don't know what most of the mass in the universe is. For one thing, concretely, that. I think it's axions, or we'll see. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, the, and uh, and there are lots of open questions. Uh, another fascinating question is how far we can, whether we can get a kind of understanding of how mind emerges from matter yeah. at the kind of, the same kind of molecular level as we now understand metabolism and heredity. Uh, that's very. I think I'd like to claim that's a physics problem. Even, uh, and there's also an opportunity to design new kinds of minds because you know it's physics that goes into designing computers uh, and, and quantum computers, all the hardware, and there are many innovations that come from physics. You know, modern electronics, semiconductors, transistors, all those things, LEDs, uh, all the basis of modern computing and communication comes from physics and comes out of deep understanding of quantum theory and physical reality. Without that, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to be talking the way we are <laughs> and, <laughs> and different generations and, and seeing each other so nicely. And uh, um, it would be, the world would be a very different place. And there's more to come. The best is yet to come. I'm, I'm sure. There's more to come. Uh, quantum field theory is um, it's fundamentally what it is, right? I mean, we well, are that, talking about quantum field theory does very, very well as a foundational description of the world. It describes well. There's no known experiment that uh, invalidates it. Doesn't, it. it yeah. doesn't describe <laughs> in terms of a few parameters, and uh, there are a few parameters describe all experiments, and. Uh, and yeah, and, and some of these experiments are, some of the comparisons of theory and experiment are extremely precise and non-trivial. Uh, so there's no doubt that that it gives us brilliant insight into how the world works fundamentally. And using that insight, people can design materials and 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 have and and, and new kinds of ways of exploiting matter. That uh, have been very fruitful, and, and they're the best is yet to come. So, I mean, for instance, we really should be using the sun to generate our energy here on Earth, but we need to be able to convert the photons into forms that we can store and use, and, and that's a physics problem. <laughs> and that, and, uh, among other and things, if, if you can solve that, it'll solve a lot of problems, right? So, the, yes. the Dyson sphere <laughs> that, and a very big all sorts of things, right? So, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it feels like Frank that we're running running around like animals, um, getting choked in a in a greenhouse that is. <laughs> <laughs> that, that oxygen is being repeated from, um, but we have this this uh, um, nuclear furnace 
eight minutes from us, we could yes. potentially take a lot of energy from it, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm very optimistic. And in fact, you, as an economist, you probably know that uh, the price of photovoltaics has been going way, way down fast. And so I'm very optimistic that uh, that it'll as it'll be a practical proposition to replace the current fossil fuel economy by uh, by a sustainable solar uh, economy. Uh, now there may be also this, there still will be niche uses for uh, for fossil fuels. Uh, in, in the transition may be bumpy because there's a lot of infrastructure, of course, and we may need to use uh, nuclear energy as a part of the transition. Uh, That's an engineering yeah. problem. We can solve that. These are if engineering, you have the right problem. well, yeah. engineering problems. Let me put it this way. I'm very, very optimistic about engineering problems. Well, we can always solve. I'm not so it. optimistic. <laughs> I'm not so optimistic about political problems. <laughs> that's yes. that's uh, that's really that's really what's been so profoundly disconcerting and disappointing in recent years. Uh, but yeah, it's a sad situation. I mean, it's a sad situation for the <laughs> next generation. Yeah. When they look back to us, and they will say. What's wrong with these people? I mean, <laughs> they knew a lot of in, they, they knew a lot of stuff, but they they made all the wrong decisions. Um, well, there's still there's still hope, and there's still things. Yeah, uh, I'm still cautious. Well, I ho hope. Oh. <laughs> let, let, let's be optimistic yeah so this was this was great frank thanks so much for spending so much time with me uh, i so, learned so much and uh and, and so i will put this together and i'll send you all the details all right very good good luck with this thank you it was, it was really fun all right